Welcome to a Sweet Saber Bible School. Thank you for watching. My name is James Reinars, and this is a clip from a Zoom class I taught recently on the history of Christian hymns, with a focus on singing devotionally. There were several parts to the class, but these clips are just of the lecture portion. More information can be found in the description. But we will look at a hymnal that came out of what is called the Oxford Movement. This was a very prominent uh, movement in the very academic side of the uh, Church of England. Uh, in the 19, um, 1930s, uh, actually it was spurred by the same controversy that caused John Nelson Darby to really begin to break away from the Anglican Church uh, in 1931. But we'll talk about that next week, actually. But the same thing caused kind of two movements to go in different directions. And, uh, you know, it was a bunch, a group of scholars, academics, who were really scholar poets. They all wrote poetry. They all wrote really, I don't know, just passionate poetry. And uh, they were burdened to revive the dead and lifeless Anglican Church. And uh, the, the most prominent leader is John Henry Newman there, that picture. Uh, looking very pensive off to the side uh, with some other leaders behind him. Uh, it was sparked in the 19, 1830s, and uh, it was John Henry Newman, a man named John Kevill, and uh, Edward, Edward Pousset. And uh, they also uh, did just a lot of writing. They did a lot of writing. Their, their goal was to just kind of revive the boring, lifeless, not going anywhere Anglican church and their meetings. And they had three lines of attack. They had a very theological and doctrine side where they wrote lots of short booklets, tracts, and it was called Tracts of the Times. And they became uh, also known as the Tractarians. So if you ever read that in a church history book, they're talking about these men from the Oxford movement, the Tractarians, the tract writers. They also really, in an effort to revive the Anglican church, dove back into history, the writings, the practices, the thoughts and views of the church fathers and but beyond just looking at history and doctrines they really tried to learn from how the church uh gatherings and meetings were practiced in the third and fourth century they really tried to dive into the, the liturgy and bring that enhance the meaning the ritual of their meetings and then they also wrote just a lot of poetry to try to speak to the souls of the readers. These was kind of ethically, ethical, more moral focused and spiritual focused. And these are the names of three sets of publications that they, they wrote. And out of the Lyra Apostolica and all these, these, so out of all these uh, writings, they sought to revive the Anglican church through this, their effort to reform, you know, it focused not just on the Bible, but as you see from the church fathers, writings, uh, but they also focused on the Bible as put into practice by the early church fathers. This led them as, on a whole to really focus on reviving ritual, uh, uh, not necessarily focusing on inner reality. They themselves were maybe very passionate and burdened, but their tool, their method to revive the church was to make uh, the symbolism and the actions and the liturgy of the meetings more rich and profound. This is the era in history where the Anglican church took on all of the ornaments and filigree and the white robes with the green sashes and different things that they do. If you were in John Newton and Charles Wesley's time, go to an Anglican church, the, the, the pastor, the, the priest may just wear a simple black smock. Just very simple clothing. Everything at the 1830s and 40s became very ornate as a way to revive the value and the meaning of their history. Out of this, they wrote uh, a group of them put to, came together and produced a hymn, hymnal called Hymns Ancient and Modern. And this was fusing together uh, the kind of intellectual academic churchmen to what the evangelicals, the, low, the, the, the more parish churches who loved John Newton and Isaac Watts and Charles Wesley were doing with hymns. This brought together some of the academic ancient looking back with what the evangelicals were doing with hymn writing. This hymn, uh, this is a quote from a textbook, you know, it experienced immediate, so this is talking about the hymnal, sorry. This hymnal experienced immediate and overwhelming success, becoming possibly the most popular English hymnal ever published. Just millions, uh, tens and tens of millions uh, published by the end of the century and even more into the 20th century. Um, and uh, it did two things. It was actually the first hymnal 
uh, to really popularize printing the words of a song alongside with the music. Before this, even say like John Newton's hymnal or Charles Wesley, they just had books of text and a separate book or a separate section of tunes. And you had to kind of flip between them. And this resulted in what you could call like text tune marriages. Um, you know, one example, we, we now can only think of holy, holy, holy with that tune. And that is uh, 100% only because it was paired with that tune in hymns ancient and modern. In a previous, uh, whatever, version or hymnal, it could have been paired with, not paired with a tune, but the singer had the option to sing it with many other tunes. But now you can, you, you just sing the tune and people know the words, right? And this is a picture from their hymnal. And I actually wanted to pop out and go to uh, just look at the hymnal. Um, this is hymns ancient and modern. This is uh, the, the original edition. Just want to say a few things in our last four minutes about how they did the tunes. You can see we have tunes, right, with the words. Now, if this were a normal hymn in these days, we would assume it meant that this uh, these words were meant only to be sung with that tune. They're kind of giving tunes as suggestions. You could go around and find other tunes. And even, um, you know, here, this page, we have uh, a tune. Sorry, I'm, not the, I'm looking for this example. This is hymn seven, eight, and nine, all on one page, right? They have one tune, second tune, and third tune but they don't tell you which words to sing it with, right? But they also have words one, words two, and words three all here. And presumably you could sing all three texts to all three tunes. This shows you at this time, there was not a thought that the words and the text were one. We now think that primarily because of this hymnal. You see what I mean? Because they did this, people began to always sing hymn number seven with one of these tunes. And if you were over here on page page four or page three, you only ever sang this, these words with this tune, right? But they were beginning to fuse these things together. And even here, you kind of see, this is a typical hymn tune like we might sing today. This is actually a Gregorian chant tune. These things are still kind of right together uh, in at this time. But we have hymn tunes married to hymn, hymns and we have in Songs and Hymns of Life, it's published like this largely because that was pioneered by this hymnal. Just the last few things. Um, what they really did, they did a lot of translating. That's the ancient part. That's why we have hymn 107 before us. If you look at your hymnal, Aurelius Prudentius wrote this in Latin. Um, but it was translated by a man named John Mason Neal. He is one of the preeminent translators of this movement. And it was even this translation was edited by Henry Baker, who is the editor of the whole hymnal. So uh, these men came together to give us what we have right here. And uh, these other translators dove back into the Latin hymns of the fourth and fifth century, the Greek hymns of the Eastern church, and even the German hymns that never really influenced English hymn hymnody and made excellent translations. We, we learned a St. Ambrose hymn in level one last semester. That is found only in hymns ancient and modern. Many of these church fathers uh, translated. And you may recognize Bernard of Clairvaux at the bottom of our screen here. Uh, he, we have two hymns that are attributed to Bernard of Clairvaux in our hymnal. And this is one of our homeworks. For time, we're not going to sing it or say much more about it. Uh, but we have, you know, this hymn, Jesus, the very thought of thee, uh, because of Edward Caswell. And that was what was happening at this moment. This was written in the 1100s, right? Ambrose wrote in the 400s. Prudentius wrote in the 400s. These are ancient things. They were not written in English. This is a large, you know, what, when Watchman Nee was adding these, he was very much bringing these ancient songs that the Christians have been singing, had been singing for a thousand plus years. They were sort of lost to history. Now we have these ancient gems right before us. And for anybody who knows hymn 111, it is one of the most tender and uh, just precious things to sing in our prayer, opening up our heart to the Lord Jesus. And uh, that is just a gem for us to have. So actually, here's our homework. You see, we have Jesus, Thou Joy of Loving Hearts 106. 
and Jesus, the very thought of the 111. These are both from the same, and I forget if it's like a 40 stanza poem by Ber attributed to Bernard of Clairvaux. And Ray Palmer did a translation taking out five or six verses. Edward Caswell did a different translation of the same 40 stanza poem <laughs> and made a different hymn out of it. Uh, and actually they share some stanzas are identical between these two hymns, but these two men worked on this Latin poem, brought us great hymns. They are part uh, of our homework for our appreciation. And then I just want us to recognize we only sing these gems in English because these men in the 1830s really labored to uh, translate and make uh, singable these ancient poems that have been sung for centuries that were lost for four or five or six hundred years and now we have gems another one well that's the end of our section you can learn more about a sweet saver bible school on our website link in the description and for now i'll say thank you thank you so much for watching may jesus bless you and may we become a saver that is pleasing to our god